All right. <sighs> Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Welcome to Little Essays Toward Truth. This month's installment, we are discussing chastity. Ooh, chastity. Not chastity bono either. If you are not a member of Second Mott, we would sincerely appreciate a donation via our PayPal account. The URL is on the screen, or you can find out more at pdxoto.org. And if you are joining us via YouTube, thanks for finding us. If you like this video, please click the like button and hit the subscribe button because we upload new content every week. Here's my standard warnings and disclaimer. So the topic of chastity is an interesting one. Um, yeah, I, I spent some time with this essay and initially I thought about structuring the class around sort of my process of dealing with the essay. And then I decided that that wasn't really fair. Um, I didn't want to give you too many, uh, too many of my own impressions to cloud what it is you may, what your personal reaction may be to the essay. So um, per usual, I do have some um, warnings here. I'm not speaking for anyone else. All opinions are my own. You may have your own opinions. You may decide that my conclusions are wrong. I am totally cool with that. Um, we're here to have a rich, varied discussion in a polite and fraternal way. Um, in addition, we will not be discussing any initiatory or oath-bound material as this is a public class and will be available on our YouTube channel. So this is my roadmap for today. Notice I got a, a new graphic for you. You are here. We are on essay number 13, Chastity. So we have three left. And at the end of the series, we will go back to man and record man as that first essay was not recorded yet. So I have a couple of suggestions as we go through the essay, if you haven't already read it. Um, at the beginning of the essay, pretend that you have no idea what chastity is, or at least forget about it as a code word for like, just say no, or keep yourself pure for marriage. Um, second, remember that while Crowley was steeped in Victorian culture and the Victorian Moors of the era, uh, there's actually two parts to this. One is Victorian Moors aren't necessarily uh, what people were actually practicing. Um, I read somewhere once that there were a higher percentage of pregnant Victorian brides than there were at any other time in recorded history, which doesn't surprise me at all. Uh, also remember that while Victorians had their own idea of what chastity and purity and those things are, modern purity culture wasn't invented yet. So when Crowley was selecting the words for his essay, there weren't uh, promise rings or save yourself for marriage rallies or purity balls where girls dressed up in frilly white dresses and went on a date with their dad for the night, which is kind of creepy to me, but whatever. Okay. So any, all that stuff didn't exist. So Crowley's concept of purity is not necessarily the same concept that uh, you'll see today in modern um, purity culture. And then finally, uh, I'd like to suggest that after this class is over, you give yourself some time to digest the material and then either go back and reread the essay or come back and rewatch the video. This is the epitome of Crowley showing off just how much he's read. Like it's the, it's the essay of how many different literary references and historical references can I cram into five pages? I accept that challenge. Um, so there's, there are a lot of outside things that I looked up and drew on to uh, the second time I went through the essay. And I found that after sitting with it for a little bit and doing some other outside reading, my own personal interpretation of the essay changed. So again, your mileage may vary, but that may be a helpful hint for you as well. All right, so first define the terms. Yes, I recycled my slide, so sue me. So the word, I started with the word chaste because when you look up chastity, one of the first definitions is a state of being chaste. Thanks so much, not helpful. So I started with chaste. Uh, this is a term that comes from the Latin through Old French. The first usage documented in the OED is in the 13th century, so about 200 years after the Norman Conquest. Uh, so this is a word that came into English later rather than earlier through the French. I would like you to take a special look at the root from the Latin caste, C-A-S-T, us, castus casta, meaning morally pure, chaste, or holy. Notice there's nothing in this initial definition that has squat to do with sexuality. Morally pure, chaste, and holy. 
Also notice that the root is cast, C-A-S-T. Uh, I will be pointing back to that later on in this presentation. So the, um, I, I put in the definitions here. They're sort of a little bit of a mashup from the OED. Generally speaking, again, they are in order of usage. Uh, although the ones with the daggers, because I finally found that little symbol, uh, slow but trainable, the daggers are the uh, obsolete usages. So the primary definition of chaste is pure from unlawful sexual intercourse. Not just any sexual intercourse, unlawful sexual intercourse. Continent or virtuous of persons, their lives, or their conduct. Now, the reason I emphasize unlawful sexual intercourse is because throughout the history of the human race, uh, we've really only been interested in regulating whether the women are having sex. There's a logical reason for this. It's annoying, uh, but the logical reason is basically thus. All of your wealth in the world as a man, as the head of a household, was going to go to your firstborn son. And you wanted to be damn sure that that was your son and not some other dude's son. And since they weren't so good at figuring out, like we didn't have DNA tests and those sorts of things, but you knew where the baby came from. You knew who the baby mama was. The baby daddy was a little bit of a sketchy situation, but you always knew who the baby mama was. So if you tightly regulate the, the sexual relations of the women of a population um, such that they are only allowed to, uh, to have sex with their husbands um, and presumably do or they get stoned or other things like that, um, then you can assure that the, your firstborn son is indeed your man's for, firstborn son. Whereas with a man, you know, go ahead and spread your stuff anywhere. Maybe there's a baby, maybe there's not. You probably never find out unless it happens to be your wife, in which case you're damn sure it's your baby. So uh, that's where the, the, initial, um, the initial issues with trying to regulate sexual intercourse and having unlawful sexual intercourse come from. And if you look at the original definition of adultery, only married women can commit adultery. There, the original laws did not allow for any man to commit adultery and unmarried women could not be adulterous. And that is specifically, again, because we were looking at trying to regulate where your property goes. Um, anyway, things evolved, it gets complicated, but those are the origins. Also the sub B to the primary definition pertains to sexual purity. This is more in a modern sense since we no longer, uh, I guess, at least in the US, uh, adultery probably theoretically exists on the books in some places, but uh, it's not something we prosecute criminally anymore. The second and third definitions are both obsolete, chaste as a meaning for celibate or single, and chaste as a meaning for morally pure, free from guilt or innocent. Figuratively, something can be described as chaste if it is undefiled or stainless pure. That was really no comma there, stainless pure, one item. The fifth definition is decent, free from indecency or offensiveness. So something that is chaste is inoffensive. Uh, an obsolete definition, something that is chaste is restrained, subdued, or chastened. And I like to look at some of these obsolete definitions because they help color the history of a word and how it might be used in a certain context. Uh, and what that history brings to how the word is used in the essay and how you choose to interpret the word may turn out to be useful to you or not. Seven, uh, figuratively, something that is chastened, modest, or restrained from all excess. Uh, this was in an obsolete manner applied to thoughts, but also applied to tastes or qualities. And the, the final definition for chaste as an adjective is pure in artistic or literary style without meretricious ornament, chastened, subdued. So the bonus vocabulary is meretricious because what the hell is that? Uh, meretricious is an adjective that means something that is attractive in appearance, but doesn't have any actual value or integrity. And this is a word that in early times was applied to prostitutes who were inevitably women. So this comes back to the whole regulation of um, chaste as a concept of uh, illegal or unlawful sexual intercourse because prostitution has never really been legal exactly. Synonyms for meretricious include, I love this list, gaudy, trashy, flashy, garish, pretentious, tawdry, cheap, fake, and tacky. So chaste was also originally used as a verb. 
And if you, you'll notice the origin here is from Middle English. And that Middle English came through Old French. And that Old French came from Latin, but it came from a different Latin word. Now, the OED says the Latin root is castigare, which when I took Latin first year, I was taught castigare is the, the noun or the verb, sorry, for to punish. Um, the OED, however, defined it as to make chaste or pure, to correct or chastise. And if you notice, the root they give there is again from cast, C-A-S-T, castus. So chaste as a verb is obsolete, and the OED's last usage example is from 1550. But I found this interesting for use as a verb because, well, let's just go through the definitions, right? So the primary definition was a transitive verb, meaning it takes a direct object. So you would chaste someone or someone would chaste you or another person. And it meant to correct or amend by discipline, to discipline, train, to bring up under restraint. And the earliest noted usage in this sense in the OED was circa 1200 um, from a homily at Trinity College. Chaste was also used as to repu reprove or to rebuke. So perhaps someone makes an indecent proposal and you chaste them. Again, this is an obsolete usage. Uh, the third definition was to inflict corrective punishment on someone. So this goes along the same lines as that first definition to correct or amend by discipline. Here it's the act of actually inflicting the punishment. To restrain, subdue, or tranquilize. So holding something back or chilling it out. Like think about what under what circumstances you might restrain, subdue, or tranquilize a person or I guess animal, but let's just go with person here. And then the fifth definition, this is the first one I've seen in the OED that starts with a question mark, um, but it, the definition is to keep chaste. The OED has one example from 1230, and this is marked as a rare usage. So chaste as a verb no longer exists. We only think of it as an adjective. And moving to chastity, which is the state of being chaste. Chastity, again, comes through the a similar um, process in Middle English through Old French in the 13th century, so 200 years post-Norman conquest, from the Latin uh, castitat, castitatem. So again, cost, C-A-S-T is the root, um, under influence of the adjective chaste. And you can see the original chastet or chasteti in that first uh, line ended with an E-T-I-E. So the, a more French way of spelling what we now have as I-T-Y, which is a slightly more Latinized. So this is actually the second adaptation of the Latin word in an old French. Um, it had earlier been taken in as caste tête and caste debt. So t and d are made in similar places in your mouth. T uses your T and d uses your tongue behind your teeth. So it, it's very similar, um, very similar speech mechanism. And then under the regular uh, operation of phonetic laws and how things go when language develops, it passed through a few other forms and then ended up in Old Norman French at Castide before it was anew adopted as chastité or the origin of our chastity. So there's a little about the history of chastity. And here's the cute little word chart that I usually clip out of my Google search um, showing we have castus, again, C-A-S-T, uh, morally pure, going through a evolution in Latin to castitas into Old French and English and into Middle English as chastity. So it went through that form chaste before we got chastity, the state of being chaste, because we can't have a state of being something if we don't have the something first. In terms of definitions, again, the first definition of chastity has to do with purity from unlawful sexual intercourse. The earliest documented use of chastity in this sense comes from 1305, but I thought I don't usually include the citations that the OED gives. So for those who aren't familiar with the Oxford English Dictionary, it always gives examples in usage that are taken from literature um, and from you know, prior works of history, published books, uh, newspapers, things like that, so that you can get an idea of during various points in time, the context in which a word was used. So I found this use from um, Baldwin's moral philosophy interesting. 
uh, Baldwin said, the first degree of chastity is pure virginity and the second faithful matrimony. So again, you have that idea here of trying to restrict or limit a woman's sexual expression. Uh, pure virginity is the best. And then if you get married, faithful matrimony, because uh, then we can be assured that that son of yours really belongs to your husband. And so it's not some other guy's son who's gonna inherit the estate. All right, figuratively, the use of chastity is, is obsolete, but it was used figuratively in a, in a purity sense. The second definition of chastity uh, is also really old. It dates back to 1225. And that definition is abstinence from all sexual intercourse. So chastity was used as a substitute for either virginity or for celibacy. The third definition here has that dagger, so it's obsolete. Uh, it was rarely used as a ceremonial purity. So something could, uh, something could show chastity for use for a particular purpose for, you know, mass or whatever. Uh, definition four, exclusion of meretricious ornament, purity of style, modesty or chasteness. So again, we have here our bonus vocabulary, meretricious. The fifth definition was similar to the fourth. It's exclusion of excess or extravagance. So this is the first definition where chastity or the word from which it, or its related word chaste shows the concept of moderation or restraint as opposed to total abstinence, right? Looking back at the, the other definitions of chaste and of chastity, they're usually a like staying away from sex totally or being very pure or they have a more absolute quality to them. And here in this fifth definition, we get the idea of moderation and restraint as opposed to a total yes or no. Uh, it's also used in attributions, for example, chastity clause, which is something that existed in marriage documents, um, and also chastity belt. Notice that a chastity belt is defined as a belt designed to prevent a woman from having sexual intercourse, not a man, a woman. Um, I like this figurative use also from the, the OED's examples. A traffic plan which enclosed Oxford in, so to speak, a chastity belt from The Guardian, which is London's major newspaper. There are also a lot of words that are related to chaste and chastity. Again, that dagger marks the words that are obsolete. But I thought this was interesting because I had heard of, for example, chasten, which replaced chaste as the verb form. So you would chasten something or someone. And I've heard of chasteness, right? The state or quality of being chaste. It's essentially a, a synonym for chastity. But I hadn't heard of chasteling which makes perfect sense that a chasteling was a eunuch. So someone who's not going to be indulging in any sexual intercourse, most likely. Uh, and chastify or chastify is also one I thought was interesting. Uh, and then the last, the last on this page is chastise. So it comes from that root of for chaste, but for uh, grammatical reasons and for um, evolution of language and sound reasons, it becomes chastise to correct, to discipline, to train, or break. So this harkens back to that earlier meaning of chaste as a verb, to chaste something, to correct it, discipline, train, or as in the case of like a horse, to, to break it. But later on in, in the essay, the concept of virile is going to come up and the concept of virility. And so I thought, you know, as long as we're talking word history, let's go back to the root vir in Latin. That there are three separate vir roots in Latin that have three totally different meanings, even though they are spelled identically. The first one, which is the one we will be dealing with, is vir, meaning man, from the Latin, and the root term, uh, the root example of the root is vir, and vir was a man. <clears throat> so we have virile, but we also have words like um, triumvirate, which was a rule, a rule of three people. Um, virtual was also is also related to that term uh, veer for man and virtue so the concept of virtue and something being virtuous were originally qualities that were associated with a man not a woman that's a different word a man veer <clears throat> but I also thought it was interesting that an identically spelt an identically lo identical looking root word veer v-i-r also means green. So, okay, we got um, verdant spring, right? But it also, separate word again, uh, evolved to mean poison or venom, and it's where the word virus comes from. So even though these are three 
these are three separate words that evolved somewhat independently, I guess. Um, they all look the same. And I love the idea that man green and poison could all be the same word, just because it amuses me. Roll with that. You might not be amused, it's okay. All right, so <clears throat> I've been accused of bringing everything back to yoga. And since we're talking about chastity, let's ask what Patanjali has to do with it. So first I wanna introduce a concept called brahmacharya. And there are a variety of ways to spell this as this is the Sanskrit term and Sanskrit does not use an English alphabet. Further, Sanskrit is based on the way a word sounds, not on uh, the way a word looks. So Sanskrit itself has very standardized uh, spelling and standardized putting together of words and grammar. Um, it doesn't work so well with um, English and English letters. Roll with it, all right? So one of the niyamas is brahmacharya. And the niyamas are one of Patanjali's eight limbs of yoga. Notice I say Patanjali's eight limbs of yoga because other yogas have four limbs or six limbs or no limbs. Um, the niyamas are often called the yogi don'ts or the restraints uh, because the first two limbs are the yamas, which are like, do this, so thou shalt. And the uh, niyamas, ni is a prefix that means not. So if the yamas are thou shalt, then the niyamas are thou shalt not, right? Uh, the word brahmacharya technically means the pre-householder or studentship phase of life in classical yoga for a man because women didn't do this. And the, in, in classical yoga, there were sort of three phases to a man's life. There was the student or pre-householder phase when a young man would go and live with the teacher and learn all the scholarly things one learns. Then there was the householder phase. You get married, you have kids, you work, you take care of your wife, you know. And then the third phase of life was sort of the modern equivalent of our retirement. Um, but the idea was that you would go, having fulfilled your earthly duties, you would then go ahead and, you know, study some more. And, uh, you know, now that you've had all this experience to draw on, you could go make your spiritual attainment, uh, either becoming an ascetic or essentially retiring, but no longer really living as a householder. So the word for student is brahmacharan, and it literally means one whose conduct is brahmic. Now there are several different ways that we can interpret what brahmic conduct is. One way is to, to say that brahmic conduct, that's someone who's behaving in accordance with the rules that are laid down for a priest because the priestly caste is the brahmin class, the brahmana. Another way to interpret brahmic conduct is to be a person whose behavior imitates the condition of the absolute. In this case, absolute with a capital A is like God, the big picture, the universe, the stuff. Um, and the absolute is called Brahman and the absolute is asexual. <clears throat> so for these, this studentship phase, when one is a Brahmacharan who is acting with Brahmacharya, um, either you're a young boy hanging out with your teacher, you're not to that householder phase, so of course you're not having sex, right? Uh, or you're, you're following the conduct of a priest, priests are celibate, so of course you're not having sex. Or you're following the condition of the absolute or Brahmin, which is asexual, meaning there's no sex to be had. Now in English, Brahmacharya has been widely historically translated as celibacy. And there's an argument that that's correct literally, but there's also an argument that that's incorrect philosophically. Um, in the more modern era, brahmacharya has been translated in a variety of other ways that come back to that, uh, what was the fourth or fifth definition of chastity about moderation, non-excess, the right use or right application of your energy. In other words, like not blowing your wad improperly, <laughs> okay? Related concept is tapas. Now, if you know about yoga and you're like, but Brahma, Chaya, and Tapas, like, where's she going? Hold on, it's coming. The English translation of Tapas is often austerities or asceticism, but the concept of Tapas itself in Sanskrit doesn't track how we tend to think of austerity or asceticism, uh, at least in modern English usage in the United States. The root of the word Tapas is top, and it literally means to burn or to glow. So the word tapas is often loosely translated to, as heat. Now in the, the earliest written forms of um, 
the earliest written forms of scripture in the Hindu world were called the Vedas. And the Vedas were a group of initially oral uh, transmission teachings, but eventually were written down. And the Vedas were said to come to the rishis, who were these seers and scholars, from the universe. Like the universe just downloaded this stuff, and that's what became the Vedas. And the Vedas essentially have a lot of hymns in them and also have some practices and ceremonies in them. So in the Rig Veda, tapas is associated with the solar orb, the sun, uh, and the corresponding deity Surya, which is where Surya Namaskar is sun salutations. And tapas is also associated with the sacrificial fire and the corresponding deity to physical fire is Agni. Um, so if you've uh, done the pose where you cross your legs over each other and your teacher calls it Agni Stambhasana, fire log pose, that's that fire of Agni. And I thought this was interesting because tapas as our heat, uh, as we are thalamites, we are interested in the solar orb. And to some extent, I would argue that we are also interested in the sacrificial fire. Perhaps not in the same way um, or the same level of importance that it played in the Vedic ceremonies and the Vedic religions, uh, but sacrificial fire is still a concept that we all know and love. Um, the Rig Veda, in particular, frequently implied that the heat of the sun or the heat of the sacrificial fire was painful or uncomfortable in intensity. And you can, I'd like you to think about uh, a spiritual experience or, or spiritual discipline and practice as that internal heat and sometimes maintaining that discipline is painful or unpleasant in its intensity. So that's kind of the concept of where tapas comes into the solar orb, the sacrificial fire, and intenseness. In the Rig Veda, the entire manifest world, according to the hymn of creation, was produced by excessive self-heating of the primordial being. Uh, in other words, the primordial soup that was out there got too hot and poof, the Big Bang and the world happened. Uh, tapas, that's a typo in that bottom paragraph, not taps, but tapas is the earliest term that was used in India for what we now think of as yoga-like endeavors. And tapas, the, that set of practices that kind of predates what we call yoga, um, was a metaphoric usage of tapas as a psychic heat or as an internal heat that was related to voluntary self-discipline. And again, as Thelemites, I think the concept of tapas and this internal heat generated by voluntary self-discipline is uh, incredibly important to where we're going with chastity. But again, your mileage may vary. So let's put brahmacharya and tapas together. Now tapas, this heat, is pursued by observation of brahmacharya, of brahmin-like behavior, and subjugation of the senses. There's a, a famous, or there was, he's deceased now, a famous yoga scholar named Georg Feuerstein. And Feuerstein called this combination of brahmacharya and subjugation of the sentences, frustration of the body-mind's natural inclinations. In this early yoga uh, world, these two things combined, this brahmacharya and the subjugation of the senses that produce this tapas, so are supposed to generate certain things within the practitioner. And these include effulgence, and I left that word just as Feuerstein used it, because we talk about effulgence in the Gnostic Mass as well, so you might want to drop a footnote and go look that up. Um, the, the Sanskrit word for effulgence is tejas. These practices also generate radiance, or jyotis, and I don't know if it's related, but the Vedic astrology is called jyotish, with an H on the end, so the same word as radiance, but with an H. They're also said to uh, produce great strength or bala, and there is actually a yoga pose known as balasana. And they're also known or reputed to produce great vitality or virya. And if you take a look at this word virya, you see that same root vir, V-I-R, for man that we saw in Latin. So if you have taken a yoga class and your your yoga teacher says oh let's all do vira one right warrior one it's known as vira badrasana uh vira and vira is it vira badra yeah i should have written this down um but those are where the word for warrior is vira and it it or vira badra and it relates back to this idea idea of vitality and this virya 
So in the Rig Veda, it talks about tapas as a religious and spiritual means of creating inner heat and creating, whoops, I have to move this so I can read it, creating the kind of creative tension that yields ecstatic states, visions of the deities, perhaps even transcendence of object dependent consciousness itself. Uh, transcendence of object dependent consciousness would be like the one we're in right now. You know, I see you, I touch my meat suit, I'm wearing a watch, like all the physical stuff. And this was important in the Vedic world because Vedic rituals had to be done exactly the right way. They required intense concentration, which is also a form of tapas, because the pronunciation and intonation and everything had to be done exactly perfectly, or it was like the ritual didn't count. This was so important to the point where they actually had a monitor whose job it was to stand there with the script. And if the priest performing the ritual intoned something wrong or pronounced it wrong or dropped a word, the monitor would correct them and they would start over. Uh, another one of the Vedas, Atharva Veda, refer, says that the deities themselves, so the gods, became immortal through chastity and austerity or brahmacharya and tapas. So these are two very important concepts in the early ideas of spiritual practice and in the early ideas of immortality and whatever that may mean to you, life living forever. Whether that's living forever physically or living forever otherwise, that's up to you to decide. So tapas is also closely related to the Vedic concept of ojas. Now ojas, I bring this up because there are magical texts that talk about the type of energy that you generate in magical practice uh, in your own body as being a special, separate, particular, different kind of energy. In my least humble opinion, this relates back to the Vedic concept of ojas. So I'm throwing it in here for you to chew on or throw out as be your will. So ojas is a particular kind of energy. And in early yogic texts, this is often invoked in the context of the retention of semen during sexual intercourse. Because again, it was all about the men, right? But, but think about it, right? If you don't know how babies are made yet, and you know that men shoot something out of their bodies uh, when they have sex, and they're supposed to be the ones that are you know, in charge and whatever, there was this idea that somehow releasing the semen was depleting your life force. And ojas is kind of a, a life force special kind of energy. So that's where that connection comes from. Um, ojas is said to be so potent that it can change or influence your destiny. And destiny is not something that one took lightly back in these Vedic eras. Uh, it, it said that it was so potent that it could grant eternal life all by itself. Again, the Atharva Veda said that the gods attained their immortality in part by brahmacharya and tapas, tapas being related to ojas, there you go. Tapas is also associated with the acquisition of psychic powers or the cities. So if you've read Crowley's eight lectures on yoga and you get to that part where he's, or maybe it wasn't eight lectures. Mm. There's somewhere where Crowley's talking about meditation and coming in on Alan Bennett, who's sitting in lotus position and bouncing about like a frog. That's one of the cities, which are sort of like the yoga superpowers, right? Um, they include things like the ability to change size, to make yourself very big or very small or very strong or um, even to begin to read other people's minds or to influence the actions and behaviors of others. So basically in the Vedic age and the epic age that followed, there was a very magical worldview and the entire world, the cosmos was just filled with these personalized sources of psychic power. So the purpose of practice was to build up your ojas and to build up your um, other types of psychic energies so that you could attain these cities. There are many stories from this era about these powerful practitioners called tapasvins or tapasas. Uh, they defeat evil, they win contests against gods. They're like, they're like the superheroes of the Vedic age, these sort of yoga, pre-yoga practitioners. But their downfall was always, almost always, one of two things. It was pride or licentiousness. In other words, their heads got too big or their heads got too big. I'm just going to go to the next slide now. That was funnier in my head. Okay, so now we're going to talk about Patanjali. In the West, we seem to be obsessed with the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. You will, might be surprised to know that the Yoga Sutras are actually not that important to the practice of yoga in India. And if that's the case, then you may ask, why the hell is the West so freaking obsessed with Patanjali? Crowley is the answer. 
uh, between Crowley, well, actually Crowley is not the entire answer, but roll with me here. Uh, Swami Vivekananda published a book called Raja Yoga, uh, Raja meaning royal, so the royal yoga, which talks about the eight limbs of yoga that are Patanjali's eight limbs of yoga. Crowley used, uh, Crowley was aware of earlier sources, so he knew about the Shiva Samhita and he knew about the Hatha Yoga Pradipika and several other texts, but he seems to have really focused on the eight limbs of yoga in Patanjali as the system that he wanted to integrate into his Western esotericism. So between Crowley writing about the eight limbs of yoga, and it's everywhere. The eight lectures aren't actually about all eight limbs, but if you look in the big blue brick, all eight limbs are in there. All eight limbs are discussed in multiple other locations. Um, so part of it was Crowley. And then part of it was also Charles Ledbetter. He wrote a very influential book called The Chakras. And he insisted that there were seven chakras, which is but one of the many systems of how many chakras there are. And Charles Ledbetter wanted there to be seven chakras because we had seven planets and seven days of the week and seven of all of these other things. And so the idea of seven chakras really stuck in the Western uh, magical system because it already mapped neatly onto what we already had. However, there are numerous other systems of mapping chakras. And in fact, the most popular outside of Western esoteric and Western yoga circles is a system of five chakras. All right, setting that aside, there are several yoga sutras that refer to chastity or the topics or brahmacharya or tapas, which we've just discussed. So one of them, uh, the yogin grounded in chastity gains vigor, which is virya, that virile, vir, man-related word that we talked about earlier. An alternate translation of this sutra is, by one established in continence, vigor is gained. So here we have the idea of continence uh, as a substitute for the word chastity. And remember, everybody translating the Yoga Sutras, unless they're a scholar, has some kind of agenda, they're definitely pushing. So whether someone chooses to use the, use the word chastity or abstinence or continence or purity um, may have something to do with what agenda it is they're pushing. All right, the second sutra I have here is tapas is one of the five observances slash restraints. Those are the niyamas. And then through asceticism, which is the translation for brahmacharya, the body and its senses are perfected. So hopefully at this point, you have some concept of why I bothered to bring up yoga at all and how brahmacharya and tapas relate to the essay du jour, which is chastity. Um, quickly, just to go over some evolution past that, because you might be like, but wait, what about Tantra? And like, they're cool with sex and stuff. Yeah, okay, true story. So yoga eventually evolved the concept of tapas. Remember earlier I talked about the, um, the cities and how the, the sort of Vedic superheroes uh, were in the yoga practices or pre-yoga practices in order to gain those superpowers. Well, the evolution of yoga became, okay, yeah, you can get those superpowers, but that's just gonna trap you in this world. They're a distraction, right? This is not your main purpose. It's, it's something that will pull you off the path that you're on. So Brahmacharya in classical yoga, which is this original early, uh, pre-Patanjali and Patanjali yoga did have a very aesthetical idea of brahmacharya. It wasn't just abstention from sexual activity. It was abstention from sexual activity in thought, word, and deed. So this is your non-Catholic, pre-Catholic version of impure thoughts, right? That was also a, a bad thing to have going on in your brahmacharya and your classical yoga. And the idea here was that classical yoga has a dualistic uh, worldview. There's Purusha and there's Prakriti. And essentially those are the difference between spirit and matter, right? The meat suit and the thing that inhabits it, not the same. And the idea in classical yoga was, you're not really so much trying to unite anything, but you're trying to dissociate your consciousness from everything that is around you, from your meat suit on out, because all of that is fake. It is not the ultimate reality. And if you spend a lot of time indulging in whatever it is your body wants to do, which would include having sex, then that's a distraction and it's engaging you in this material world when the goal of classical yoga was to disengage from the material world and to get the hell out of it. Uh, just to make it a little bit harder because no good deed goes unpunished, in classical yoga, abstinence was said to make the yogin especially attractive to the opposite sex. 
So this is the equivalent of, right, a man with a wedding ring rocks into a bar and like all of the single women fling themselves at him. Well, apparently if you were like super yogi back in the classical yoga days, all the hot chicks wanted you. <clears throat> they were just there to distract you from your path. However, with the rise of the tantras uh, and the Middle Ages, medieval tantrism, we developed a non-dual worldview, which said that, okay, yeah, we have a concept that I am not my hand and I am not my head. Like I'm not my meat suit. There's a consciousness thing that lives inside of it, but the world of spirit and matter are inextricably intertwined. So it's a non-dual worldview where, where these two things come together and play nice. And if both of these things are coming together and playing nicely in our worldview, my job is not to escape the world of matter, but as an embodied being, I can use my body as a tool to help further my attainment. So instead of my body being an obstacle, now it's a vehicle. So as a result of this change in worldview and the rise of tantrism, um, we end up with a more sex positive culture and it really revolutionizes both Hinduism and Buddhism in, in certain aspects. Now, much of what is readily available in terms of uh, tantric texts, we're getting a lot more. We have a lot of scholars that are still working on translating things that are literally written on like banana leaves and whatnot. But much of what's readily available right now is what I call the male-centric icky tantra. Um, and, it, and that's really, it harkens back to that idea I was talking about, about retention of semen as retention of life force. Well, the idea of icky tantra is the reason that you get women involved is because they have life force. And if you have sex with them and retain your semen, you can also suck up some of their magic life force too. So again, it was very male centric. And the idea wasn't that the women were going to get enlightened or make progress because, you know, oh, don't worry about those things, my dear. Um, but that as a male practitioner, you could essentially steal some of the woman's life force to help add to your own immortality. All right, so let's read an essay, because that's what we came here to do. This is the theme slide. So in all of the slides that have this background, the words that are not in white boxes are the words that came from Crowley's essay directly. Anything in a white box is commentary or side material. And there are a couple of instances where the slide with the main text will either repeat or repeat a line. And that's for continuity to help us to um, get back on the track when I derail it. Um, so that's just to give you an idea of what, what's Crowley's words and what's not so that you understand the flow of the essay. In any case, Wendy, will you take this one, please? Those works of ancient and medieval literature, which more particularly concern the seeker after truth, concur on one point. The most worthless grimoires of black magic, no less than the highest philosophical flights of the brotherhood, which we name no, insist upon the virtue of chastity as cardinal to the gate of wisdom. So, oh, seeker after truth, that be you. In this case, cardinal is being used as an adjective, meaning of the greatest importance or fundamental. So in summary, literature relevant to the seeker after truth, Chastity is the key to the gate of wisdom. Is anybody triggered yet? Let's go to another slide. What the hell is the gate of wisdom? Notice Crowley, oops, notice Crowley capitalized gate of wisdom. Now he's not being sloppy here. So he means something. What could it be? Well, it's probably not the stuff that the Kabbalah Center says is related to the new moon in Taurus and how that's the gate to wisdom. It's probably not these sculptures I found or the songs or paintings or the several dozen books I located. Um, I also noticed that there are multiple uses of gate of wisdom. Um, it's sort of in common parlance. The silver gate of wisdom I saw pretty frequently as a reference to the wisdom that you gain having life experience. The gate of wisdom academy is a private school in Nigeria. There's a hotel in China that's owned by the Thames Company that is the Gate of Wisdom Hotel. I found an article about the genealogy of the Kings of Wisdom or the Kings of England that refers to the Gate of Wisdom. And you would be shocked at how many YouTube videos I found of video games that refer to the Gate of Wisdom. So apparently it's also a video game thing. I tried to find, like, give me some spiritual Gates of Wisdom. This wasn't all that much more productive, by the way, but there's a lot out there to read. So I came up with several different gates of wisdom that you can choose from, and there are also more. 
For example, Najaf is called the Gate of Wisdom. It is a city that is sacred to the Shia Muslims as the burial place of the Imam that they believe to be Muhammad's true successor. And that is a, also a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So we have this burial place that is the Gate of Wisdom because it is where Muhammad's successor was. We have a concept of 50 gates of wisdom in the Hebrew scriptures and Jewish Kabbalah, which I think is probably getting us closer to where we wanna be. Um, I also found a text that is in a, an old Jewish ethical work that is a collection of epigrams attributed to a scholar named Solomon. And the book is divided into chapters, but the word for chapters is gates. I do not speak Hebrew, but it looks like shiarim to me. Uh, there is a chapter in that book called Shar Ha Hokma, the Gate of Wisdom. You may recognize Hokma as one of the Sephiroth on the Tree of Life. We're going to come back to that later. Crowley would also be familiar with the Gates of Wisdom as the concepts were used in Christianity, since that's the religion in which he was raised. So one of the translations of uh, Psalm 90:12 is teach us to order our days rightly that we may enter the gate of wisdom. Now I find it sort of interesting. There are a number of places in the Psalms where if you run a Google search for say gate of wisdom in quotes and then the word Psalm or the word Psalms, you'll come up with a whole bunch of different verses. But if you look at the different translations, this is the new English uh, Bible translation here. Um, you won't find any gate of wisdom. So for example, there's no gate of wisdom anywhere in the King James Version of the Bible, and there's no gate of wisdom anywhere in the Darby Bible. Uh, there are, however, several sermons and other biblical teachings and uh, biblical commentaries that talk about gates of wisdom uh, as leading to either the Church of Christ, uh, meaning Christ's church, the, the Jesus church, the one we all know about, or to the house of God. And the house of God is both a metaphorical name for church, but also has esoteric and occult meanings that I invite you to explore on your own. There were several essays from Theosophy uh, and some works from Blavatsky that I looked at trying to summarize and decided it was too far afield and there was more interesting stuff. But Theosophically, um, she refers to the gate of wisdom as the occult. So occult studies, according to Blavatsky, are the gate of wisdom. And then figures, on a figurative level, the gate of wisdom can also be initiation or death as a, a point event. I, I also found this that I thought was really interesting because it's uh, how often do you get to find a thesis about a conspiracy of the subconscious, Yeats, Crowley, Pound, Graves, and the esoteric tradition. But this turns out to be highly relevant to the topic at hand. So roll with me here. The applications of tantrism to magic, where one of its functions is to generate altered states of consciousness and enhance creativity, is well known. Ellen Wilson remarks accurately that sexual energy serves as a stairway to new levels of power utilized, quote, to create new habit patterns of intensity, an intensity which can be used as a, quote, ladder for the individual to ascend to still greater heights of intensity, focusing upon the illumination rather than upon the sexual pleasure. Pound, that's Ezra Pound, in Religio, hints at this secret function of sex, which he considers the underlying factor in the mysteries of antiquity, pointing out that, quote, for certain people, the Pactin Cateus is the gate of wisdom. Uh, Cateus is the Egyptian word for uh, vagina, essentially. And that, quote, paganism included a certain attitude toward a certain understanding of coitus, which is the mysterium. So there you have that, gate of wisdom as possibly related to sex and sexual function as a magical tool. But wait, there's more. Jeff, will you take this, please? Oh, sorry, we're back. To, take this in the next slide because we're going back to uh, back on track. Okay. Um, so one, didn't we just read these ones? Yeah, just at the top. The, the, oh, okay. The, okay. Yeah. Those works of ancient and medieval literature, which more particularly concern the seeker after truth, concur on, the, on one point. The most worthless grimoires of black magic, less than the highest philosophical flights of the brotherhood, which we name, which we name no, insist upon the virtue of chastity as a cardinal, as cardinal to the gate of wisdom. Next, 
continue. Let first be noted virtue, the quality of manhood, integral with virility, the chastity of the adept of the rose and cross, or of the grail knights of Montsalvat, is not other than very opposite to uh, that of which the poet can write. Chastity, that slobbering sot, sate, his lust without the walls, muse, and is gone, preening himself that his lute lips relent, or to that emasculate frigor of Alfred Tennyson and the academic schools. So here's where we start in with the references. Uh, first, I'd like to call your attention to virtue and virility, both starting with that vir root from Latin referring to man, the quality of manhood and manliness. Uh, the, the Knights of Montslavat are essentially the Knights of the Round Table. Emasculate, just for fun vocabulary, is to deprive a man of his male role or identity, to castrate or to make something weaker or less effective. And frigor is cold or chill. So I like his reference to the emasculate frigor of Alfred Tennyson and the academic schools. By the way, that poetry, uh, which I expected to be related to Tennyson based on its placement, is actually a quote from a Crowley play called The World's Tragedy. The script is readily available online. Now, for as much as Crowley is bagging on Tennyson's concept of chastity here, Chast uh, Tennyson's actually someone that he probably had some decent respect for, or at least read a fuck ton of when he was at Oxford, or Cambridge, sorry. Um, Tennyson was a British poet, and he was the poet laureate during most of Queen Victoria's reign. There actually are a ton of poems that you may have heard of. Uh, I picked four, The Lady of Shalott, The Lotus Eaters, The Kraken, and The Charge of the Light Brigade. In fact, Crowley has an essay he calls The Lotus Eaters, which is at least a, a tip of the hat to Tennyson, um, if not an homage. Uh, Tennyson was heavily influenced by the Romantics, so his idea of chastity is going to be, you know, the, the maiden of the, oh, no, I can't, like, you may woo me and kiss my delicate hand, but, like, I need to stay pure for my wedding. So that's where some of that uh, comes from. All right, Dan, please. The chastity whose magical energy both projects and urges the aspirant to the sacred mysteries is quite contrary in its deepest nature to all vulgar ideas of it. For it is, in the first place, a positive passion, in the second, connected only by obscure magical links with sexual function, and in the third, the deadliest enemy from every form of bourgeois, or uh, bourgeois, bourgeois. Um, Morality and sentiment. So, <laughs> yeah. So that's that's where the word bougie comes from. Like that we say, oh, that's so bougie, right? Like the bourgeois morality and sentiment is all about, you know, chastity. Um, so what Crowley's telling us so far is that his concept of chastity is not the one that the reader is probably familiar with. So especially when he says. Uh, it is connected only by obscure magical links with the sexual function. So he's not talking, strictly speaking, about chastity as it relates to sexual intercourse. So far, so good? Okay. Um, Wendy, will you take this one, please? It may assist us to create in our minds a clear concept of this noblest and rarest, yet most necessary, of the virtues if we draw the distinction between it and one of its ingredients, purity. Purity is a passive or at least static quality. It connotes the absence of all alien admixture from any given idea as pure gallium, pure mathematics, pure race. It is secondary and derive use of the word which we find in such expressions as pure milk, which imply freedom from contamination. Chastity, per contra, as the etymology castus, possibly connected with castrum, a fortified camp, suggests, may be supposed to assert the moral attitude of readiness to resist any assault upon an existing state of purity. Will you please also read the footnote? This is original to Crowley. Starting with the root? Yes. The root, cast, means house, and an house is Beth, the letter of Mercury, the Magus of the Tarot, 
He is not still in a place of repose, but the quintessence of all motion. He is the Logos, and he is phallic. This doctrine is of the utmost Kabbalistic importance. The root cast means house. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I put it there twice, didn't I? All right. This is what no happens problem. when you have to cut and paste things. Notice Crowley insists the root is cas, C-A-S. Isn't that curious? Uh, well, I like the tie-in to Mercury and the idea that chastity uh, implies action and not standing still. I'm not so sure that Crowley's etymology really stands up uh, to modern academic scrutiny. In fact, if you look at the root of cast, in English, we would call it pure or cut. And in Latin, it gives us castrare and castus. And this is, again, what we talked about earlier, where we had castigate and castrate and cast and chase. That's where all of these things come from. So I call this fun with etymology. Um, I'm not sure if the etymological works that Crowley was relying on were just a little more creative than what we have today, or if Crowley was actively stretching. Your mileage may vary. That's up for you to decide. Uh, Jeff, will you take this little tidbit, please? So dear to heaven is saintly chastity, that when a f soul is found sincerely, so a thousand liveried angels lackey it, sang Milton, with a true poet's veil piercing sword vision for, for services but a waste unless action demands it. Now Crowley's just spent all this time telling us that the poets got it wrong and you know Tennyson is full of it uh, and then he gave us a contrast between purity as an element of chastity but not the thing itself and now he's telling us that Milton got it right. Since I had no idea what the context for this was I consulted my friend Google and learned that this is from a mask by Milton called Comus. And this would come along, this comes along the lines of once again, Crowley is going to throw us another obscure literary reference, obscure to us anyway, uh, if not to the reader in his time. So this was a mask and a mask is a type of play. This dates from, I wanna say 1882, but I didn't write the date down, which wasn't very smart of me. In any case, the, the, the idea of Milton, that Milton was trying to convey with this is that there is power and reward of virtue here, virtue relating to a woman in the face of temptation. Uh, the essential plot of the story is that there are two brothers and a sister and they get lost in the woods after dark. And we all know the woods after dark is a scary place to be because every fairy tale from the beginning of time has told us that. So Job, who's like the big head honcho God, sends the spirit down to look after the siblings so they don't like get hurt and stuff. Now there's this dude Comus and he's essentially like, you know, lecherous, yucky old man. Um, he's a sorcerer and he's the son of the witch Circe. And this is relevant because Circe is the only witch in Greek mythology, really. Comus entices mortals to drink from his cup and says, ah, oh, you know, just drink some of this stuff, man. and I'll give you all sensual pleasure and like the world's going to be great. But what really happens if you drink from the cup is that your head gets changed into an animal head. You forget what your life was like before. You don't know you have an animal head and you think that you're gorgeous. So essentially it's a bait and switch. Um, Comus shows up in disguise. He disguises himself as, as you know, a handsome young thing and uh, sort of lures the sister away. He essentially kidnaps her. And one of the brothers is worried that his sister is going to you know, give up her virtue as it were to this stranger and that would be no bueno. The other one is defending her hidden virtue, which is her chastity. And this excerpt is part of the brother's defense of her chastity. So I thought I would give you a little more context. So the, the full section reads, but rigid looks of chaste austerity and noble grace that dashed brute violence with sudden adoration and blank awe, so dear to heaven is saintly chastity that when a soul is found sincerely so, a thousand liveried angels lackey her, driving far off each thing of sin and guilt. And in clear dream and solemn vision, tell her of things that no gross ear can hear, till oft converse with heavenly habitants, begin to cast a beam on the outward shape, the unpolluted temple of the mind, and turns it by degrees to the soul's essence, till all be made immortal. But when lust by unchaste looks, loose gestures, and foul talk, 
but most by lewd and lavish acts of sin, lets in defilement to the inward parts. The soul grows clotted by contagion, embodies and embrutes till she quite loose the divine property of her first being. Just to give you a little more context of what these words are actually supposed to mean, uh, I turned to an online version of what amounts to cliff notes because ain't nobody got time to read all this stuff getting ready for one class. The explanation is that the, the, this begins with rigid looks of, of chaste austerity, and that's a reference to what he said before, and he'd been talking about Medu or Medusa's head, which was on Minerva's shield, and Minerva is known as the unconquered virgin. Um, Minerva is a uh, warrior goddess who is essentially owned by herself. She's beholden to no man. Um, anyway, she has Medusa's head on a shield because uh, what's his name with the labor is cut off the head. And anyway, now anyone that looks at Minerva's shield sees Medusa's head and gets turned to stone. So the brother is saying, look, just like looking at Medusa's head on the shield is going to turn Minerva's enemies to stone, chastity is going to confound sexual violence and just turn it into adoration and awe, right? Stay chaste, all will be well. When a soul is really chaste, a thousand angels accompany it. And uh, Milton uses her when he refers to the soul. So a thousand angels accompany her and wait on her. And these angels will defend the pure soul by driving off evil and imparting spiritual knowledge. And because this pure soul then gets to keep talking to the angels and has this constant communion, the temple of the mind, which is the meat suit body, uh, turns into the likeness of the soul. So in other words, if you live this pure life and you're super chaste, then your body is going to partake of your soul's nature and join that soul's immortality. But when the soul defiles itself with these lewd and lavish acts of sin and lets in defilement to the inward parts, um, it's going to be dragged down into and doomed to exile in the visible world. And if you think back to talking about those original yogis and their idea that the body and the mind or the body and the spirit were separate, this idea that indulging your body will drag your mind and doom you to the physical realm um, is repeated here in Milton, which probably isn't what he intended, but it's an interesting parallel across cultures. Right, so next, Dan, please. The Sphinx is not to be mastered by holding aloof, and the brutish innocence of paradise is always at the mercy of the serpent. It is his wisdom that should guard our ways. We need his swiftness, subtlety, and his royal prerogative of dealing truth, or de dealing death, sorry. So we have both the Sphinx and the serpent. They both start with S. Notice what's capitalized here. Sphinx, paradise at the mercy of the serpent. The serpent has wisdom to guard our ways. Again, anytime Crowley's got capital letters, um, pay attention to where those capitals are. So for the Sphinx, my first thought was, oh, well, of course you can't master the role of the Sphinx by, by standing back and not saying anything. And then I was like, oh, duh. He didn't say master the riddle of the Sphinx. He said master the Sphinx. So he probably means the four powers of the Sphinx, which are knowledge, will, courage, and silence. But remember that Crowley added this fifth power. He said, we want to add to go, right? To correspond with that fifth element of spirit that is generally recognized in the Kabbalah. And so the idea that this is related to chastity, remember he said purity is a state. It's something that just sort of exists, whereas chastity is an action, this goes along with that fifth power of the Sphinx to go, right? Because you're moving. Also, if you want to read more about the Sphinx, see Libra Aleph. There wasn't enough time to include it all, so you're going to have to look that up on your own. All right. Also, uh, on this little tiny quote, we have a bit about the serpent. We know a lot about serpents. So over here on your right is our Kabbalah tree of life. Remember earlier I mentioned Hokma, Hokma is wisdom, and that pretty blue spot is Hokma on the tree of life. So if you want to think about the gate of wisdom as being the gate to Hokma, that's where we're hanging out on the Kabbalah right now. But back to the serpent who climbs up the tree. So we have several different 
references uh, several different words within this tiny little snippet of the essay that bring out lots of things related to snakes. First, we have the serpent and the brutish innocence of paradise, which is a clear reference to the Garden of Eden. Now remember in that story, the serpent knows the truth about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And unlike God, he does not lie to Adam and Eve and say they will die if they eat from the fruit of the tree. He tells them the truth. You'll be like God. You will know, you will have the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, there's also reference to the serpent's royal prerogative of dealing death. Remember that Cleopatra committed suicide by kissing a snake, basically. She got an asp and uh, that's kind of snake and was like, yep, kill me now. Also interesting, Apophis, also known as Apep, who is the antagonist of Ra, our sun god, is the god of night and darkness and death. And if you happen to watch Stargate SG-1, Apophis is also the name of the bad guy in that whole series. And I find this hilarious because I was preparing this slide deck as I was beginning to rewatch SG-1 and I was like, oh my God, Apophis, there's the snake right in front of me. Anyway, all right. Um, I also thought this was interesting that Apophis is sometimes depicted as a coiled serpent, but often dismembered, cut into pieces or under attack. And if you know me, you know I have a cat and I'm pretty much a old cat lady in training. So uh, I loved this quote from this website saying that there's a famous depiction in spell 17 of the Egyptian Book of the Dead in which the great cat Mao kills Apophis with a knife. Because of course, if someone's gonna kill a snake, it's gonna be a cat. So Mao is the defined cat. Uh, he's essentially an emissary or a personification of the sun god. So we have solar cat guarding the tree of life, which held the secrets of eternal life and divine knowledge, whipping out a knife and slaying that serpent. Very interesting contrast to, to me at least, to the um, story of the snake and the tree of life in the Garden of Eden. All right, um, Wendy, please. The innocence of the adept we are at once reminded of the strong innocence of Harpocrates and of his energy of silence. A chaste man is thus not merely one who avoids the contagion of impure thoughts and their results, but whose virility is competent to restore perfection to the world around him. I sliced this paragraph repeating the, the last sentence because there was too much to cram on one slide. So uh, we've all heard of, we had the innocence of paradise which was essentially a weak innocence, right? The serpent came in and took it away. But now Crow is talking about the innocence of the adept, the strong innocence of Harpocrates. So we've, we've got a contrast of one kind of innocence that's like, meh, and now he's like, innocence, Harpocrates, yeah. Um, and on the left here, there's a picture of a relief that is in the um, museum in Oxford that is Serapis and Isis as serpents, which I'm not used to seeing. And in the middle there, we have baby Harpocrates, who is identified by making his classic gesture of silence. Also on the right, there's a statue of Harpocrates, uh, this time as, excuse me, as an adult or as an older male. And you get that idea, same thing with that symbolic gesture. I also didn't realize until I was putting this slide deck together that Harpocrates is not strictly Egyptian, but was adapted by the Greeks from the Egyptian child god Horus. So this, the, the idea of Harpocrates, who is the god of, of silence and secrets and confidentiality, all things that play a lot into magic. And I invite you to think about how silence, secrets, and confidentiality also play into chastity. Um, but the idea of Harpocrates developed in Alexandria, in part of Egypt, but under the influence of the Greeks. So there you go. Again, we're going to repeat that last sentence. Jeff, will you take this one? A chaste man is not merely one who avoids the contagion of in her thoughts and their results, but whose virility is competent to restore perfection to the world about him. Thus, Parsifal, who flees from country and her attendant flower witches, loses his way and must wander long years in the desert. He is not truly chaste until he is able to redeem her, an act which he performs by the reunion of the lands and the sangrail. If you're reading this paragraph and you don't know who the hell Parsifal and Kundry are, that's okay, because I'm about to tell you. If you read the paragraph on first reading, it sounds like, oh, well, you bring the lance and the grail together, and that seems like really obvious representative of, or symbolic representation of, you know, heterosexual sex, right? Just like in the Gnostic Mass, we have the lance and the cup, and they come together, and that's obviously symbolic. 
my first thought was, oh yeah, Lance, cup, they come together, Lance goes into cup, there you go. So he must be talking about Parcival having sex with Kundry, but no, that is not how the story goes. So, oh, I have a, <clears throat> one second, I gotta grab this thing. Sorry guys, I've never done this before, but I had to print this out because it was pretty awesome when I started reading it. Okay, so Parcival is one of the knights of the round table, essentially. And Crowley was sort of obsessed with Arthurian legend, which if you read enough Crowley, you'll eventually find out. And he was especially obsessed with Parsifal, which is this opera that Wagner wrote. And so in this opera, uh, it's, it's interesting to me because Nietzsche referred to this as uh, a work of perfidy, vindictiveness, and a secret attempt to poison the presuppositions of life. So Nietzsche doesn't think so much of Parsifal, um, but... Crowley really loves Parsifal. So this is something that uh, you should be interested, uh, interested in, I think. Um, Parsifal had its premiere in 1882. And I'm reading from a description of, uh, of a book in um, The Guardian, again, British newspaper. Parsifal unfolds in an unsavory twilight milieu of death, curdling blood, and toxic sex. The castle of Montserrat is home to a community of grimly celibate knights who guard the Holy Grail, a chalice holding the blood of Christ collected after the crucifixion, along with the holy lance with which he was pierced. Their depressive leader, Amfortus, has an agonizing and separating thigh wound that just won't heal, just like Henry VIII's, if not as smelly. His erring father, Tisharel, selfishly declines to die, but hangs on so he can savor the sight of Christ's blood that is ritually unveiled before the faithful. There's a lot going on in this work. But essentially, uh, there's this woman named Kundry, and she's kind of one of the bad guys-ish. She doesn't want to be a bad guy, but she's under the spell of this evil magician guy named Klingsor and kind of has to do whatever he says. I often wonder if the Klingons were named after Klingsor, by the way. And the original ones, not the ones in the next generation. Anyway, so Amfortas, who is one of the Grail Knights, comes to Klingsor's castle, and he's got the Holy Spear. And that's the spear that was used to pierce Christ's side while he was hanging on the cross. So Amfortas is going to come kill the evil magician Klingsor. But Klingsor's like, I don't really want to die. So he's like, Kundry, yo, you're under my control. You, go seduce this knight. So she goes out and seduces uh, Amfortas, and as she's kissing him, Klingsor steals the Holy Spear from Amfortas and stabs him with it and inflicts this wound that won't heal. So some stuff happens. The other Grail Knights show up and they're like, Kundry, yo, what happened? And she's like, man, I want to, but like, I really can't tell you. Then eventually Parsifal shows up and Kundry's like, Parsifal, I know all this stuff about you. Like, let me tell you about your history and like who your mom was and all these kinds of things. And he's like, dude, who the hell are you? And Klingsor says, I got this idea. Kundry, you seduced Dan Fortis. Why don't you seduce Parsifal? And she's like, but I don't want to. And then, you know, she kind of has to because she's under his influence and under his command and she's essentially his slave. So Kundry goes out to try to seduce Parsifal. But Parsifal, being stronger than Amfortis, is like, screw you, Kundry, I will not be seduced. Then Kundry realizes that Parsifal has figured out she's the one that resulted in my buddy Amfortis getting stabbed. So he's like, dude, take me to Amfortis. And she's like, no, nope, can't do that. Uh, I'm gonna curse you to wander around in the desert for a bunch of time. And Clothor appears with the Holy Spear thinking, hey, I stabbed Amfortis, so I can totally st uh, stab um, Parsifal. But when he goes to stab Parsifal, Parsifal grabs the spear and Clingsor and his castle disappear, poof. And then like some time passes and an act goes by and whatever. Anyway, Kundry's laying around, she's half dead because this evil wizard dude's been abusing her for all these years and making her do all this stuff. Parsifal shows up and he's still got the Holy Spear in his hand. And she's like, oh my God, it's Parsifal. And Parsifal's like, yo, Kundry, what's up? And Parsifal um, sits down and she washes his feet and dries them with her hair, which is a highly symbolic act because that is uh, Parsifal playing the role of Christ there's a story in the Bible where a woman washes Christ's feet and then dries them with her hair. Uh, Parsifal then, as his first act, now that he's sort of been Christ-like, made Christ-like, he baptizes Kundry. So now Kundry's a good Christian and she is safe from Klingsor. They go back to the castle where the rest of the Grail Knights are and Parsifal has the Holy Spear, having figured out what's going on, 
heals Amfortus. He touches the spear to the wound, proof it magically heals. He then unveils the grail, which is at the castle. Kundry sees it and collapses. So all he's really done is bring the two objects back into close proximity. So far, so good. It's really a hollow story. If, if you have a chance to read the whole thing or any of the commentary or even just this monsalot.no page on Kundry um, talks about the different aspects and different elements that are are put together um, within the character of Kundry, and I think it is totally worth your while to go read. But in any case, so here we have this idea of Parsifal initially flees from Kundry, like, not, you're not going to seduce me, lady, I got this stuff figured out. Um, he wanders in the desert because he's been cursed, but he, he becomes truly chaste when he can redeem her, which he does by bringing the lance and the grail back together. Go Crowley. Okay. Wendy, will you take this one, please? Uh, can I ask a question first? Yeah, absolutely. When it says she collapses, like, did she die or what? You know, I tried to figure that out from reading commentary because I couldn't grab the original text, and I'm not sure. Okay. Excellent question. I had the same one. Thanks. Okay, so... Chastity may be thus defined as the strict observance of the magical oath, that is, in the light of the law of Thelema, absolute and perfected devotion to the holy guardian angel, and exclusive pursuit of the way of the true will. It is entirely incompatible with the cowardice of moral attitude, the emasculation of soul, and stagnation of action, which commonly denote the man called chaste by the vulgar. Beware of abstinence from action. Is it not written in our lecticon? For the nature of the universe being creative energy, aught else blasphemies the goddess and seeks to introduce the elements of a real death within the pulses of life. So the reference to abstinence from action is from Liber B. Magi. I put the verse there so you can take a quick look at it if you'd like to. But again, we have Crowley reinforcing the idea here that chastity is action. Observing your magical oath, perfected devotion to your holy guardian angel, pursuit of your will. It's the opposite of what everybody else has called chaste. I think we're on board with that now. So, Jeff, this is the paragraph that I read and went really cruelly. You said it was only like loosely tied to sexual function and now you're going to use all this language. But go ahead, Jeff, entertain us. The <laughs> The true knight errant of the stars imposes continually his essential virility upon the throbbing womb of the king's daughter with every stroke of his spear he penetrates the heart of holiness and bids spring forth the fountain of the sacred blood splashing its scarlet dew throughout space and time his innocence melts with its white hot energy the felon fetters of that restriction which is sin and his integrity of its fury of righteousness establishes that justice, which alone can satisfy the yearning, yearning lust of womanhood, whose name is opportunity. As the function, <laughs> okay. As the function of the castrum or castellum is not merely to resist a siege, but to compel to obedience of law and every pagan within range of its writers, so also is the way of chastity to do more than defend its purity against assault. For he is not for he is not wholly pure who is imperfect, and perfect is no man in himself without his fulfillment in all possibility. Thus then may be an inst must he be an instant to seek all proper adventure and achieve it, seeing well to it that by no means should such distract him or divert his purpose, polluting his true nature and hamstringing his true will. Okay, this is like all the evocative, like how many sex things can I throw into a paragraph when I'm not actually really talking about sex? It's like someone dared Crowley to write this, okay? So I'm sure somebody has a comment. <laughs> well, I just had that kind of, I, I, I had that kind of reaction to it. It's like, um, you know, almost like his use of the letter P in the Gnostic Mass during that. It was kind of like, okay, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna, you know, switch this around and see exactly how many sexual innuendos that I can make with this with that and having having declared right after right before that that I'm not talking about sex at all I, just, I had kind of the same reaction it was it was hilarious it was like really imposes his essential virility on the throbbing womb of the king's daughter like what is this a bodice ripper come on dude 
All right. Oh, okay. I have a thought. <laughs> um, I think maybe he's trying to defend uh, or explain why he chose the word chastity in the first place. Like he's making an analogy here. He's, he's doing a conversion from one form of the word to the other. And so it's necessary for him to talk about point A and point B and where they overlap. I like it. Vanessa, you were starting to talk. Yeah, I had, uh, when we were doing our the Kabbalah class and one of the uh, meditations was on Percival, mm -hmm. uh, it starts out with him taking the virtue of another man's betrothed by kissing her against her will mm -hmm. and and that's what sends him on this journey to redeem himself uh, mm -hmm. and 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 then in so fact also coming across country and and redeeming her as well but but it just to me you know like that um that force onto another kind of kind of came up in this for me it was just like and then how does that relate to Percival and his you know um quest for for you know his chastity or his ability to be um, pure in a sense mm -hmm. I think there's even a part in there that his purity of not um being seduced by another kind of gave him that um foot up against the rest of the knights who were trying for this quest for the grail and were unable to um, to to actually attain it because they did not have this like chastity. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's pretty interesting. I, I'm not quite sure where it's all going, but I just, there's, it's funny when things just like whoop, all come together in a totally different space. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a seamless web. Anybody else want to throw anything in here? I, I thought it was interesting uh, on the previous slide when you, you, you got into the, the spear and the, the holy grail. And I was like, what is that all about? And then it transfers into this just to kind of signify the whole thing. And that's very interesting <laughs> too. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, how the, I guess, yeah, relatable thoughts from relating one thing to another, how that flip. Thank you. Anybody else want to weigh in? All right. So notice that after we've talked about Kundry and Parsifal's quest, and we've talked about the knight errant of the stars and all of this like sexual imagery. It ends with, no perfect is no man in himself without his fulfillment in all possibility. So here, Cole is very clearly giving us the idea that chastity does not imply cutting off possibility. Like, oh no, Sexual sex is bad, like I can't go there, right? Because he makes that reference to like the book of the law says the word of sin is restriction. So like, we're not gonna say that's a thing, but he also says, not a, the man has to be instant man, let's say person, right? Magician has to be instant to seek all proper adventure and achieve it. Seeing well to it that by no means should such distract them or divert their purpose. So go ahead and have that proper adventure, but don't let that adventure distract you from your devotion to your holy guardian angel or your pursuit of your own true will. We're almost to the end, but there's so much more to go. Oh my goodness. Um, Dan, will you take this last one, please? Woe, woe, therefore to him, the unchast, who shirks scornful and the seeming trivial or fe flees fearful, the desperate adventure, and woe, thrice woe, and four times woe, be to him who is lured by the adventure, slacking his will and demitted from his way. For the laggard and the dastard are lost, so is the toy of circumstance dragged down to the nethermost hell. Sir Knight, be vigilant, watch by your arms and renew your oath for that day of 
is of sinister augury and deadly charged with danger, which ye fill not to overflowing yeah. with gay deeds and bold of masterful, of mansful chastity. Whoa. I love the idea of chastity as manful because he's used, he's consistently used all of this knight imagery and words like virile and virility and virtue, which all derive from that man root from Latin. But he's used those words all to refer to chastity. And historically, regardless of whether you're used to the romantic, like, oh no, but sir, I couldn't possibly, like you don't think of a knight as being chaste. <laughs> like that's chaste, chastity is something that goes along with like womanness uh, in a way. And here he's saying, no, 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 it is an essential quality of the knight. There's also some fun vocabulary here, uh, just in case I didn't know what these were. So I looked them up for you. So here they are. But before we go, let's summarize chastity. And actually there's quite a bit more to go, um, but I see we're almost at time. So let's just keep pressing forward. In summary, the literature relevant to the seeker after truth all agrees chastity is the key to the gate of wisdom. Chastity is the opposite of what the poets, poets like Tennyson write about it. Chastity is a positive passion only linked to sex by obscure magical links and the enemy of bourgeois morality and sentiment. Purity is a passive state. It is an adjective. Chastity is active. It is a verb. Crowley invents some etymology to put chastity and castles together. Have fun with that. Milton got it right. Angels don't waste their time, energy, attention, or service on the unchaste. We can't master the sphinx by standing still. The wisdom of the serpent should guard our ways. Forget the innocence of paradise. The innocence of Harpocrates is for us. This means avoiding contagion and restoring perfection like Percival. Chastity may thus be defined as strict observance of the magical oath that is in the light of the law of Thelema, absolute and perfected devotion to the holy guardian angel and exclusive pursuit of the way of the true will. Standing still is bad, don't do that. So uh, in the holy books, there aren't that many references. Oops, do, do, do. In uh, Liber Alorita, we have, thou hast appeared to me as a huntress among thy dogs, as a goddess virginal chaste, as a moon among the faded oaks of the wood of years. Um, the full commentary just says, this chapter 418 made up of a pentagram, sorry, I couldn't find the little icon for it, and a hexagram, planets, gods, vision of nature. So this is a, probably a reference to the goddess Diana, who was seen as a huntress. She had dogs. She was virginal unto herself. She was uh, not owned or under the, the, under the control of any man. And um, Diana was known as the huntress goddess of the moon. This one, um, I'm actually gonna read part of the commentary for. So Jeff, would you please read this paragraph? Sorry, from Libra Cortis Sancti Serpente. Um, I have sucked out the blood with my lips. I have drained her beauty of its essences. I have abased her before me. I have mastered her. I have possessed her and her life is within me. In her blood, I inscribe the secret riddles of the Sphinx of the gods that none shall understand. Save only the pure and voluptuous, the chaste and obscene, the androgen and the gyander, and have passed beyond the bars of the prison that old, uh, the old slime of Chem sets up in the gates of Amenti. I was like, wow, okay, like that's going to be enough to explain in one slide. So I'm just going to read a little bit from the commentaries on the holy books because I was like, what the hell is this about? Other than I did notice that it's the, the pure and voluptuous together, one thing, the chaste and obscene together, one thing, the androgyne and the gynander, two things that have passed beyond the bars. So I thought that was interesting. All right. <clears throat> Crowley says, this constitutes a profound riddle of holiness. Thanks, Crowley. Uh, there's a footnote about the gematria. I'm skipping that. Those only understand it who combine in themselves the extremes of moral idea, identifying them through transcendental overcoming of the antinomy. They must have gone further yet beyond the fundamental opposition of the sexes. The male must have completed himself and become androgyne, the female, and become gynander. This incompleteness imprisons the soul. To think I am not woman but man or vice versa is to limit oneself, to set up a bar to one's motion. 
It is the root of the shutting up, which culminates in become, quote, Mary and Violet, or, quote, Black Brother. By the old slime of Kem, it is meant the principle of stagnation, which was symbolized in Egypt, Kem, by Sebek, the dweller in the mud of the Nile. Note, this is not evil, but merely the stoppage of the energy of the universe. The contending forces of good and evil are complementary, and to be united by love under will, as I too often do loosely and clumsily, thanks to my education and the limitations of language, to mean that which is against my true will. The implication is not of anything active, however loathsome or terrible it might appear. Any such idea is to be assimilated by love under will with its contradictory, thus reaching in ecstasy to a new conception transcending the planes of these opposites. Thus, my chief obstacle is the belief that any idea, active idea so ever is evil, and it is therefore the main tenet of the slave gods, original sin, the existence of a personal devil opposed to almighty goodness, which threatens my will. Amenti, the west, the place of death, is the quarter attributed to Osiris in his aspect as the slain god, that is, in modern slang, to Jesus. To us, the word of sin is restriction. The only possibility of evil is that the will may be hampered. On the contrary, to the slaves of Jesus, there is scarce an act which is not of the nature of sin. Even our righteousness is as filthy rags. There is none good, no, not one, etc., etc., ad nauseum et praetor. To us, then, Jesus is the very fount and origin of all possible evil, for he is synonymous with the idea of restriction on every plane. And there's two more pages. But in the interest of time, I'll leave you with that as a taste. Well, he also wrote a bunch of other stuff on chastity. And we have a few minutes to go through. And if you'll indulge me, we may run a few minutes over today. So, um, Dan, would you read this little snippet from chapter 22 of the Eucharist and the Art of Alchemy from Magic in Theory and Practice, including the footnote? Chapter 20 of the Eucharist and of the Art of Alchemy. Chastity is a condition. Fasting for some hours previous is a condition, and earnest and continual aspiration is a condition. Without these antecedents, even the Eucharist of the, of the one and the seven is partially. Though such, uh, though such is it intrinsic virtue, that it can never be wholly bought of its effect. The footnotes reads, uh, the word chastity, chastity is used by initiates to signify a certain state of soul and of mind determinant of a certain habit of body, which is no wise identical with that what is commonly understood. Chastity in the true magical sense of the word is inconceivable to those who are not wholly emancipated from the obsession of sex. Inconceivable? I don't even think you know what that means. <laughs> Notice he chose the word inconceivable as opposed to, you know, there's no way they could understand it or, you know, just like choosing the title chastity for this essay, Crowley has a freaking enormous vocabulary. He could have picked from hundreds of other words, but he chose chastity. Was that just to piss me off personally? I'm not sure. All right, uh, chapter eight of the preparation of the instruments of art also uses chastity. Wendy, will you take this section, please? In all actions, the same formulae are applicable. To invoke a god, i.e. to raise yourself to that godhead, the process is threefold, purification, consecration, and initiation. Therefore, every magical weapon, and even the furniture of the temple, must be passed through this threefold regimen. The details only vary in inessential points, e.g. to prepare the magician, he purifies himself by maintaining his chastity and abstaining from any defilement. But to do the same with, let us say, the cup, we assure ourselves that the metal has never been employed for any other purpose. We smelt virgin ore and we take all possible pains in refining the metal. It must be chemically pure. Uh, see you. the book of the law and the commentaries they are on for the true definition of this virtue. So again, you have a reference, but not a full explanation to what Crowley means by chastity in this context. And then 
There's also this small chunk from Libra Aleph, which has a lot of capitals and so is slightly difficult to read. But um, Jeff, will you take a stab at it, please? On chastity, my son, be fervent, be firm, be stable, be quick to make impurity, how one course of ideas seeketh to infringe upon another, to quell the virtue thereof. Gold is pure, but to drink molten gold were impurities to the body and its destruction. Law is the customs of a people. If it intrude thereon to alter them, it is an impurity of oppression. So also diet is in accord with digestion. Ethics were an impurity therein. Love is an expression of the will of the body, yea, and more also of that which created the body. And its operation is commonly between one and one, so that the interference of a third person is impurity and not to be endured. Nay, even the thought of the third person hath but ordinary not part in love. So that as thou seest constantly in thy life, love being strong, taketh no heed of others, and some other and some after interference brings misfortune. Now then, shall we therefore cast out love or accept impurity herein? God forbid. And for this cause, see thou well to it that in thy kingdom there be no interference therewith, nor hindrance from any, for it is perfect in itself. So this is another writing of Crowley's on chastity uh, at a specific time in a specific place. But notice there's none of the imagery of the knights here. And there's none of this like, sex, sex, sex. I'm going to use some sexual images, but it's not about sex. Uh, instead, he's talking about perfection and about purity versus impurity and how to think about that in terms of chastity. Uh, final last little tidbit in the book of the law, which it is not my job to interpret for you. Uh, chapter 3, verse 55 says, let Mary and Violet be torn upon wheels. For her sake, let all chaste women be utterly despised among you. And the commentary in the law is for all is quite lengthy. So I'm going to gloss over a part and read a part because reading this, I found this extraordinarily helpful and perhaps you will too. And if you don't, well, I warned you that your mileage might vary. So Crowley begins this comment by saying that the, the name Mary is connected with Mars from Sanskrit, blah, 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 connected to Mare for C. You know how I feel about Crowley and his claims about etymology, so I'm just going to skip all that part. Um, Crowley then goes on to talk about how uh, Mary, or Mary is Shakti, she's the te, the magical door between the Tao and the manifested world. The great obstacle then is if that door be locked up. Therefore, Our Lady must be symbolized as a whore. Note Daleth, the door, Venus, the dove, free flowing. All this is linked up in symbol. Clearly, at last, the enemy is this shutting up of things. Shutting the door is preventing the operation of change, i.e. of love. The objection to Calypso, Circe, Amida, Kundry, and company is that one is liable to be shut up in their gardens. The whole of the Book of the Dead is a device for opening the closed vehicles and enabling the Osiris to go in and out at his pleasure. On the other hand, there seems to be a sealing up for a definite period in order to allow the change to proceed undisturbed. Thus, earth lies fallow. The womb is closed during gestation. The Osiris is plugged with talismans. But it is vital to consider this as a strictly temporary device and to cut out the idea of eternal rest. This Nibbana idea is the coward mother's boy idea. One ought to take a refreshing dip in the Tao no more. I think this must be brought forward as the cardinal point of holy law. Thus, the Nuit cries to me that is balanced by the formula of Hadith, come unto me is a foolish word, for it is I that go. Now the semen is God, the going one, is shown by the ankh or sandal strap which he carries because he goes in at the door, stays there for a specified period, and comes out again, having flowered and still bearing in him that seed of going. In parentheses, the birth of a girl is a misfortune everywhere because the true going principle is the lion, serpent, or dragon. The egg is only the cavern where he takes refuge on occasion. Okay, I admit that part pissed me off. Libra 418 explains this succinctly, third aether. Moreover, there is Mary, blasphemy against Babylon, for she hath shut herself up, and therefore is she the queen of all those wicked devils that walk upon the earth, those that thou sawest even as little black specks that stained the heaven of Urania, and all these are the excrement of Corazon. 
It is the shutting up that is hideous, the image of death. It is the opposite of going, which is God. Women under Christianity are kept virginal for the market as Strasbourg geese are nailed to boards till their livers putrefy. The nature of woman has been corrupted. Her hope of a soul thwarted, her proper pleasure balked, and her mind poisoned to titillate the jaded palates of senile bankers and ambassadors. Why do men insist on innocence in women? One, to flatter their vanity. Two, to give themselves the best chance of A, escaping venereal disease, and B, propagating their noble selves. Three, to maintain power over their slaves by their possession of knowledge. Four, to keep them docile as long as possible by drawing out the debauching of their innocence. A sexually pleased woman is the best of willing helpers, one who is disappointed or disillusioned a very psychical eczema. Five, in primitive communities to serve as a guard against surprise and treachery. And six, to cover their secret shame in the matter of sex. Hence the pretense that a woman is pure, modest, delicate, aesthetically beautiful and morally exalted, ethereal and unfleshy, though in fact they may know her to be lascivious, shameless, coarse, ill-shaped and unscrupulous, nauseatingly bestial, both physical and mentally. The advertisements of dress shields, perfumes, cosmetics, anti-sweat preparations, and beauty treatments reveal women's nature as seen by the clear eyes of those who would lose money if they misjudged her, and they are loathsomely revolting to read. Her mental and moral, moral characteristics are those of the parrot and the monkey. Her physiology and pathology are hideously disgusting, a sickening slime of uncleanliness. Her virgin life is a sick ape's her sexual life a drunken sows, her mother life all bulging filmy eyes and sagging udders. These are the facts about innocence. To this has man's Christian endeavor dragged her when he should rather have made her his comrade, frank, trusty, and gay, the tenderer self of himself, his substantial complement, even as earth is to the sun. We of Thelema say that every man and every woman is a star. We do not fool and flatter women. We do not despise and abuse them. To us, a woman is herself, absolute, original, independent, free, self-justified, exactly as she is. We dare not thwart her going, God is she. We arrogate no right upon her will. We claim not to deflect her development, to dispose of her desires or to determine her destiny. She is her own sole arbiter. We ask no more than to supply our strength to her whose natural weakness else will pray to the world's pressure. Nay more, it were too zealous even to guard her in her going, for she were best by her own self-reliance to win her own way forth. We do not want her as a slave. We want her free and royal, whether we love fight death in our arms by night or her loyalty ride by day beside us in the charge of the battle of life. Let the woman be girt with a sword before me. In her is all power given. So say this, our book of the law, and there's like five more pages, but that's just a taste in case you'd like to look up the rest of it later. So before I close off the video and open some chat, here are the references that I went through. I found the page on Milton's Comus particularly useful, that e-notes. Um, and as always, Thank you for visiting Second Ma and helping to keep Cascadia Flemic. We would sincerely appreciate your donation via PayPal on our PayPal page. And again, if you enjoyed this content, please hit like and subscribe to our YouTube channel for fresh content each week. Love is the law, love under will.